Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to kick off our panel with just a brief introduction of our panelists today. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce uh, to you is uh, Mr. Rob Lampa. Rob has been with our campus for almost a year. And I say that with a lot of enthusiasm because uh, we were very excited when Rob joined our campus, coming from a few other campuses and having some industry experience as well. But his first day on the job was at our 2013 Sustainability Forum. So this is his second year with us at the forum and almost his full anniversary. So thank you, Rob. Rob's also, I didn't mention, the director of our campus physical plant through facilities planning and management. The next person I'm going to introduce, and I don't know where the microphone went, but could you grab it? Who's got the, Eleanor, can you bring it up? <laughs> Thanks. Um, our, our next person is Kathy Metalcamp. Kathy, I would describe on our campus, as, as you have, if you've been here all day, you know that Kathy, as you know, Kathy speaks um, to the students really well. She has um, several followers and fans. But um, personally, I would describe Kathy as that person that you just really, really hope accepts your invitation to Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> she's just a lot of fun. She's so bright and talented, and she's great to have around. My next colleague is Mr. Mike Corradini. So Mike has been on campus the long, well, 33 years. I'm sorry? 33 years on campus. And the one kind of thing I, I knew about Mike uh, was that he goes to Costa Rica on vacation every year. And he loves Costa Rica, and I, so I asked him, why do you go to Costa Rica? Is it the eco-friendly tourism and, and great places? Do you zip line and go volcano diving and windsurfing, all those great things? And he said, nope, nope, nope. I am very risk averse. He said, I, I just love nuclear, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I suggested he talk to our friend Greg Nemet, uh, because Mike doesn't think nuclear is a problem and Greg thinks it's not the safest form of energy. So you guys can talk later. All right, so that brings me up to our fourth panelist, uh, Craig Benson. Craig and I have known each other for, um, well, a long time. So before I had wrinkles and Craig had gray hair. <laughs> 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 uh, so, um, with that, I'm going to kick off our, our campus, uh, oh, and Craig is the department chair for geological engineering, also civil and environmental engineering, and of course his third hat, the director of sustainability education and research for our campus. So thank you very much, all four of you. The first question I'm going to kick off, and we're going to have a couple fun questions, and then we're going to hand it over to our audience. But the first one is, obviously, the reason we're all here. Students, right? We are here to teach students and further their education. And hopefully, at the end of the four years that they spend with us, or five or six, that they have a very strong appreciation to be good stewards of the environment. So because we're here for education, it also takes a lot of resources for educating students and doing this research. Resources in materials to have buildings like this, resources to fuel and um, power our lights, our water. So what is the role of education in addressing climate change as we know that we use a lot of resources on this campus to educate our students and conduct research? What's the role that we have? Do you pick on anybody or is everybody in? He who speaks first, Mike Cordini. So I, I guess the... Um, the main role of being here, after being here, now that you've said how long I've been here, the main role of being here is really education. So I think to some extent. There you go. Yeah, move it a little bit closer. Good. The, I think the, the main purpose is to make sure the students see the connections between various things in the world, whether they be engineers or in humanities or social sciences, et cetera. But I think at least in engineering, um, a way to do it I'm sorry, maybe it, you do it differently with the motivated students the other part of campus, but at least in engineering is some assignment, right? Something that gets them involved. And at least uh, I think in this case, 
uh, I try to do it in terms of, of starting a discussion with them and then also giving them something that they can do themselves and try to discover it for themselves. So an example that I would bring up, and again, it's a bit of an advertisement, is that about 15 years ago, uh, out of the Nelson Institute, there was a doctoral student by the name of Paul Meyer, and Paul, when he was finishing his work, wanted to characterize, his work was essentially trying to characterize the, we'll call it the externalities of power production, stationary power production, and to do it in a way that essentially tried to get students interested and others, is he had developed a, a software package where one could play like a little game to say that I want to look at stationary power production in the future, and I might need a 10% more, how do I do it? I have constraints, whether it be capacity, cost, and I'll call it um, environmental impact, essentially releases to the environment. And that turned into something now that is used uh, here on campus and is used in classes. I use it in my classes to try to have the students think about with the constraints of cost, external, externalities, environmental impact, and then how they can design something for the future. So that's a way, not the way, but you've got to get the students involved in some fashion. I think that's very important. Sure. Anyone else want to comment on that? Rob? I think, am I on? Yep. I do. OK, anyway. No, I don't. Talk closer. Helps turn it on. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this being the fourth campus that I've worked on, I, I think, as I had mentioned in my, my comments this morning, it's the role of institutions like this and every other campus and college across the country and across the world to teach people and to talk to them about climate change and, and what it means because we are raising the next generation of leaders and scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs and, and economists and everything else that's going to continue to make our societies function. And I think we, we need to instill in the students here at, at all levels and understanding of the principles of sustainability and the effect, potential effects of climate change so that they are better informed to make decisions in the roles they're going to have as they move forward into their professions. And so I, I think we have an inherent responsibility to, to teach as many people to talk about it as much as possible because though it may still be debated, as our keynote speaker said this morning, the fact is there is climate change the science has shown that it is happening, and we will need to either adapt or to mitigate or to be involved in it at some level, and we all have a responsibility to do that. And so I, I can't see how we could not have this be part of the general education of all students on campuses. Sure it's good to have you here, Rob. <laughs> Something Angela didn't tell you about me is I have a tendency to change the rules. Um, so she gave us these Pechacucha talks, or Pechacucha talks. They have the slides every 20 seconds. And the first thing I did when she did it is I changed all the timings on the slides. So I could give the talk I wanted, not the one that went every 20 seconds. Yeah, and they, you almost set them all back on me. And the thing I want to do with this question about education is make a friendly substitution of teaching and learning as opposed to education, meaning that those twin processes always go together, no matter which side of the fence you're on. And then maybe a second friendly amendment to it is to say, it's not just what goes on in the classroom, but it's what goes on for the four year, five year, six year <laughs> experience here in everything that happens. And then having said that, I just want to echo what my colleague said, that in that broadest sense of the word, what I would hope that happens is to awaken, kindle conversations, things, actions, getting to try them out that lead to a lifelong learning. So what happens here continues. I think I can turn the switch on, too. Are you changing oh. the rules, too, Craig? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, it's really good to hear these different remarks. I think one of our roles here on campus, too, is to get people to think more deeply about how they approach solutions to problems. Um, I think in the, in the climate space is one in particular where there's a lot of advocacy and, and not enough solution orientation. Application. Yeah, we really need to take responsibility for our own role 
in climate issues. And uh, we need to focus more on developing solutions as opposed to asking others to develop solutions for us. And I think it's one of our key roles as a campus is to educate students to be, a, you know, so that they learn how they can work together with each other with different skill sets to create real solutions to problems, which may involve actually changing our own behavior as individuals in our society, as opposed to asking others just to make, change the way they do things, but actually embracing change ourselves. And I think it's our responsibility to infuse that thinking amongst our students, because uh, with that, uh, with that approach, I think we can be successful in, in accomplishing some real change. And, and that's one of the things that we, we want to accomplish on campus, a number of in, initiatives that we're undertaking. Great. So with some of these thoughts on taking on our own changes, there are certain things that would affect um, us as campus leaders making decisions and changing practices. So my next question is, how can the UW adjust its e operational policies or our practices, or our curriculum to adapt to those needed changes? How can so we adjust? You, I'll give you the engineering answer. I tend to get to, <laughs> I, think so. I, think, I think, so I'm gonna say something I think provocative. Everybody here has goodwill. You're in the room because you believe that this is an important issue. So let's count us, then there's 44,000 people on campus. So the only way to get to a larger group is that you have to make it somewhere uh, embedded in their minds. And so I'll give you one that campus could do. We've suggested this a number of times in engineering, it's never occurred. You actually ought to charge for what you use. In other words, if you were to monitor what you do in the buildings, whether it be for heating, for ventilation, for lighting, et cetera, and charge back for it, you'd see an awful lot of conservation, okay? Even for the space you and even for the space you have. I'm sorry, I forgot yeah. about the space. Yeah. No, <laughs> but of course, this is not part of campus officially, so this no. space is free to us, right? Well, no. half the room is. Really you guys had to pay for it. <laughs> but, I, but I really do think, I really do think if you want to, to deal with a majority of the general population, they have to somehow feel it. They can feel it by believing it, they can feel it by paying for it, or they can feel it by somehow accessing it. So I, I really think from a campus standpoint, that's where the first thing I do, I start, I'd start tracking what we use, because then you probably start using less of it. To echo what you said, I know a couple that lives off the grid. And they say, you know, we think twice before we do a load of wash or light a bulb or something, because they generate all the power themselves. So Rob, what would that look like? What would that <laughs> yeah, model look like it, if <laughs> um, you became the banker on campus charging? Well, I, I, for I do think we need to think about you know, all levels of sustainability and certainly not only the consumable um, resources we use, such as energy, water, and that type of thing, but even too, you know, what are, what are we doing with the physical spaces that we have on campus? I mean, we have departments which shall not be named that basically vacate one building to go to a brand new building, but they still want to retain the space they have in the old building. But again, there really? is no charge for that. And, and yet, on the other hand, space costs money. You have to maintain it, you have to clean it, you have to light it, you have to heat it, you have to do all those things, and all of those things continue to take resources. And so, if we were to do that kind of thing, besides the great wailing and gnashing of teeth I think there would be across the campus, it may certainly get people to start thinking about that. We do have a number of buildings that are, most of the buildings are all metered for electricity. We probably have about 30% of them for steam almost all of them for water and a few other things, but we could expand upon that and then see if that's something that the institution might want to take a look at. But I agree with the other panelists that really to make a connection for each of us, it has, it has to matter here. You have to say, why is this important to me? Because if it's important to you, you're going to do it. If it means something to you, you'll take the extra time to, to do the little things. And, and the little things do add up. I mean, when we have 40 to 60,000 people here, depending on mm -hmm. whether you count students, staff, faculty, everybody together, all 60,000 little things add up to a pretty good sized thing. And we probably have three or 400 of those kinds of decisions every day. And so it, it, it does matter what you do. Don't think that what you do doesn't matter. What if you took away parking places? Well, right now there's no student, official student parking on campus. And there is for certainly, uh, those who are willing to pay their XXX amount of dollars for a parking spot. But um, 
that would open up some green space. It certainly would put more emphasis on public transportation, and it may cause the regional area to, to put more mass transportation in. Because we are a big player in the area, and certainly a lot of people come here every day to go to work and go to school. Therefore, there certainly would be demand if there was no, no, or no place to park. Just to come back to some of these issues uh, about co what I would call cause and effect. Um, I think there's a certain group of our, our population, our student body, our faculty, our staff that will do things because they believe strongly in them. But the, but the lion's share need to see cause and effect. And I think that's one of the great challenges in our society is our connectedness of policy uh, and consequences. Our energy policy is, uh, and our economy are, are fairly diffusely connected. We don't really sense the real cost of energy, the impacts of energy uh, in our pocketbook or, as, as, or personally. Give you an, just think about as an example, I bet everybody has a smartphone. I see Mike has an iPad there and he probably has a smartphone in his pocket. Do you, Mike? No. All right, he doesn't have one in his pocket. I think it's in his backpack. Uh, I have a pencil. Is there, how, many, how many people have a smartphone with them? Right? Yeah, almost everybody. So a smartphone, this looks like a, little, a pretty low power consuming device, but a smartphone with all the IT infrastructure associated with it uh, consumes the same power as a, a household refrigerator. And a student today comes to campus with three of these devices. All right, three. So every student, and I'm not uh, putting this on the back of students, it's just a reality. They come with three devices. So it's like a student comes with three refrigerators of energy. Right? But we don't sense that or feel it very well at all. If we had a bill for that or a carbon consequence associated with using that resource, we might think about it differently. But it's very diffuse and hard to feel. And I think by connecting the cause and effect of our decisions more directly, we would probably make very different decisions and perhaps make them more rapidly. But I think until we do more of that, our change will be at a fairly modest pace. Right. But there, it, it does end up being where there are going to be, have to be, we're going to really have to reflect on what, what is our cultural norms and, and feelings of, of satisfaction and, and happiness going to be from here on forward. Because I don't know that we will find, I don't believe we will find a technological bullet that will allow us to continue bus business as usual and to be able to mitigate uh, climate change at the same time. So we're going to have to start thinking, how do we want to live? What is the future going to look like? And how do we start preparing for this? How do we maybe take these three and 4,000 square foot homes and squish them back to, to you know, 2,000 square foot homes that people get used to having and, and are, are enough? I mean, there's a whole, you could probably have a whole curriculum around the whole concept of enough and what it is and what it means to, to us and not only here, but across the world. Yeah, I think that's one of our great challenges educationally, not just uh, with students, but with faculty and staff right. as well, about how to have self-responsibility I mean, for solving the issue. Just as another example, I, I read in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago that our automobile production in the United States is back to 16 million new automobiles a year, which is great from an economic growth perspective. But if you think about it, and the lion's share of the automobiles that are being produced and the profit margin is coming from SUVs and pickups. So the, high, you know, the most energy intensive and climate intensive vehicles. Um, and so there's a disconnect uh, because we are championing that growth and it, we do need economic growth to be successful as a nation. But at the same time, it directly contrasts energy consumption and emissions. And so at some point, those two have to be rectified. And I think our challenge as educators is to find that nexus of, um, of rectifying those two issues, which are, are really juxtaposed. So I have one last question, then we're going to open up to the audience. But there's a couple of things that you've all mentioned, and it is these trade-offs. And thinking about, you know, this is real choices that we need to start really challenging ourselves with. So whether it be eliminating parking on campus and does that have a cause that then focuses people to park in the neighborhoods and grab the closest bus to campus? And how does Metro deal with that? Who pays for that? Or is it charging for every square inch on campus? Who's going to pay for that? Is that a tuition hike? Is that a taxpayer issue? Whose dollar is that? Or is it that we tax everyone's smartphone plug and iPad plug and 
computer and desktop and laptop and the amount of time they spend in their office with the lights on versus the lights off. How do we start to look at these trade-offs as a, as a, as a campus and, and deal with some of these things that are really good challenges for us? And as a leader, a world leader, as a universal institution, our one institution, how should we be approaching this problem of these types of trade-offs and who makes those decisions? Well, so, some of those kinds of things will certainly have to be planned for. And when you're talking about use charges and what it is and setting up a whole different metering infrastructure, I mean, in, in China, they're building brand new university and all the residence halls there, every single dorm room has its own meter and all the students are charged for the amount of energy that they use in each, in each uh, dorm room. Also, conversely, lots of times, if you've been to Europe, I was in Norway a couple summers ago, and in order just to get all the lights and everything to go on, you had to put your room key card into the mm -hmm. slot to it's make everything true come in on. Union South. Yeah, we right. put that and in Union South to, for a and purpose. And then you had to pull it out yeah. again in order for when you went, but it automatically shut everything back down again. So, I mean, there are some physical ways to do some of that, but it's going to have to be a combination of the technologies plus the, the inherent behaviors. So, I'm not sure what your question was. They can hear me. I'm not sure what your question was. Is it, is it a matter of oh, we want to be recognized or we want to do something whether we're recognized or not? Because do I, the right I thing. Th okay, so I think there's two different things. If we want to be recognized, then I think it's a policy. It's a policy question relative to the leadership if they want to make a statement. And, and some examples of how that policy can be exemplified by certain actions. But if we want to do a better job of it, I really do think I come back to I, I, I come back to my first thing, which is to get the students involved, you've got to get them to make a decision. To make a decision, you can either make the decision by where they live on campus or where they live near campus, or you can do it in some sort of uh, game playing role. As I said, I use Paul Meyer's uh, tool. Unless you, unless you experience the decision making process yourself, either because you're spending money or because you're playing a game trying to see if you were to do it, you really are not really getting involved in it. As you were saying, you don't get it in the heart or in the pocketbook or wherever you want to get it. Right. So I really think it's a matter of that. I, I'm not so big on recognition. I, I just came back from Washington. I go there an awful lot. Everybody wants to be recognized. They always want to have some sort of meeting about something, and nothing comes of it, right? So I, I, I do think to the extent that if we can do something and then advertise what we do in terms of saving energy, saving water, and then after we do it, show what we've been able to do with it, yeah. then the recognition would come by action versus advertisement. Excuse me, but advertisement. Sounds great, sounds great. Absolutely. So I'd like to open it up to the audience for some other questions. So if, show of hand, please, we'll get the... Uh, so I'm a business analyst. I work at Doit, and uh, uh, I, one of the tools that I carry around in my back pocket is observation. And um, it's, it's interesting to make observations about how people react to a particular technology. And what I've noticed is that um, um, the handicap accessible doors, which are great, and those are just awesome, and we've got to have those, um, is that... Um, they're typically on the right-hand side of an entryway. And here it is, you know, it's 10 below, the wind chill's 30 below. Um, students inevitably will open the handicap door. And of course, that stays open for, you know, the time it takes for a person to get through that who's, um, who's differently abled in some way. Um, so what I'm wondering, what I'm leading up to, I'm just giving you an example. Do we have a, um, I'll call it a campus energy suggestion box? Um, so what I'd like to do is say, you know, can we look at this and I wonder if there's a way in which we could change students' behavior in such a way that they actually use the left-hand door instead of the right-hand door? You know, things like, don't use this door unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> um, and because what happens, at least to do it, is that at the other end of the building, I can feel when someone opens that door because the wind just goes rushing through. So I, I, it's just a, a question. I was wondering if, if we could have such a thing. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that's an excellent idea, and I would think either the Office of Sustainability or we can serve or a combination thereof could be places where you could send that information. We could certainly look into it. But yeah, when the door stays open, and unfortunately, I see a lot of people not just accidentally open the door. I see people come in and just boom, hit the button to open the doors as well. And we really need to stop that behavior as well. But when we have the buildings in such a tight air balance for the winter to try to prevent as much infiltration, then you have these automatic doors that for needed reasons will stay open for 15 and 20 seconds. Yeah, we really are really trying to heat the outside at that point. So appreciate the comment. Great suggestion, we'll follow up. Yeah, so I asked a question earlier just about sort of getting past the silos and getting sort of different entities to work together. And you've talked a lot about sort of focusing on students and teaching and learning and that sort of collaboration. And so one of the things I'm interested about is how do you work on getting that collaboration across all of your constituents? You know, Kathy talked about earlier with the knife fork spoon scenario that all of a sudden they developed the, they noticed that the workers in Union South were a community that they could be impacting. And so I think there's a lot of those across campus. How do you get that message to all of those people and how do you get them working collaboratively together to get to a sustainable end to make the university more sustainable across everybody, not just the people sitting in this room who care? Go ahead. Mike just leaned over and said he was asking you, Kathy, but go ahead, Rob. Oh, I, all I was going to say go is, ahead. I mean, one thing I think needs to be realized, and, and I've noticed a little bit on this campus, it certainly has been prevalent in some of the other campuses I've been at, is that we got to remember that sustainability is definitely, it's an institutional initiative. And it, and it isn't done in the Office of Sustainability. It isn't done in We Can Serve. It isn't done in each college or each school separately. It's, it's an overarching uh, initiative that really needs to affect the whole campus. And from another standpoint, it also doesn't happen just in a whole bunch of student groups or that, wow, this is just something that the students are interested in. No, this is faculty, this is staff, this is all of the operations of the campus. And as Kathy has so often mentioned, you know, learning happens everywhere on campus. It happens in the residence halls. It happens in the operations area. It happens in the classrooms. It happens all over the place. And we have to take advantage of those to try to teach not only students, but also to continue to educate the staff and faculty say, yes, you too are part of this. And yes, you could unplug things when you leave your room. You could turn your computer off. You could turn your lights off. You could do a whole number of things. And I think we could actually engage the students to perhaps do even staff and faculty office audits to give them ideas about green tips that they could do. And, uh, you know, as well as doing a maybe a green dorm room certification or something like that. It's just the beginning of an education process. And those kind of initiatives will then start the conversation. Can I add just a bit to that? I, I, um, I, th I think the challenge is always how to get, you know, it's not the committed, because committed are already committed. Right. It's how to get the rest of the community involved. And, yeah. and you do that with, by a variety of different tools. And a lot of that's incentives to draw people in to get used to a different type of behavior. I think of when, uh, when we moved here to Wisconsin 25 years ago, we moved here from a very large southern state that is not, I would call it, economically progressive, I mean, environmentally progressive. Uh, and, and it was a real change of state for us when we moved here. And, uh, but we had a lot of things going on in our state which really drove a lot of uh, environmental progressive and drew, drove behavior. For example, you know, our, our, our home, we recycled just about everything these days, but that was a learned behavior. That's not something I had in me when I was born or, or even brought to me when I moved to that state, to this state. It was something that was created through a series of incentives and processes within the state of Wisconsin. And I think that's how you draw people in and then their behavior becomes a learned behavior right. later on. But so we had to create structures for uh, our community to want to engage in these processes and, and then develop uh, a sense for their inherent value. Can I ask a question of the audience? So, particularly the younger audience. So, when you lived at home, were you the ones that went around, turned off the lights, made sure things were closed, made sure there were not doors ajar? My, my point in asking the question, don't answer, is that, <laughs> is that 
you have to own it, all right? Yep. You have to own it. I think what Craig is getting to is that. And, and so I'll even not talk about sustainability. Put that aside or energy, yep. put that aside. If you're in a building, you're going to a classroom, if there's something broken, do you tell somebody in the building that this is broken, that this is not functioning? I do that. I see somebody who's an associate dean in engineering. I'm one of the nastiest people when I call up the main part of engineering saying, this is broken, when is it going to get fixed? Right? I'll fix it, but I'm not a union, so that means if you start me, seeing me touch it, it could be even more broken when it's all done. <laughs> but, but I think it's a matter of you have to own it, and sustainability is just one piece of the, of the picture, at least on a campus or in a setting. You have to own the structure and own the whole uh, milieu, so to speak, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, and, and you have to draw people into ownership. Right. You just right. can't and, talk and about it. And it's almost drawing. by example, to the extent that you see at least in my case, other faculty worrying about something, then you start worrying about it because you feel that's part of what your responsibility is for your being a citizen of the, of the uh, community. Exactly. In answer to your question, I was gonna say, you know, I've learned some things not to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I'm as good at saying what works. But some of the things I've learned not to do, because you know, I get a mic, I get to be in the classroom. I've been here since the 70s. Uh, preaching hasn't worked real well. Telling people what to do hasn't worked real well. And believe me, I've tried both of those. Yeah. Not being able to help myself. And I find I've backed off on those two things. Um, to the extent, you know, faculty makes their money with their mouth. So we tend to talk a lot. Um, as I've learned to listen more, and I think I've heard that echoed all day long. Listening has worked in a lot of cases better than talking, although I find it extraordinarily difficult, especially when I have a microphone. This is perfect. You want to get it closer. Yeah, I want to get it closer. Uh, but the last thing I was going to add is that doesn't work is staying in your own either world or box or however you want to put it. And for a lot of reasons, I haven't been good at my own box. And I think to the extent, you know, I never got the chance to study abroad because we didn't do that back in the 60s. The fact we didn't have airplanes and things that flew nearly as nicely as they do today. And we didn't have money <laughs> that we're going to take it. I mean, we flew on things with propellers that, if you haven't done it, it really is a lot of fun, but not over, <laughs> not over the ocean. So. Um, Back to your question, one of the things for me that hasn't worked is staying more parochial. And to the extent I can urge anybody to get somewhere they haven't been, be it on a farm, mm -hmm. be it in the physical plant, Rob's store, I'll tell him, your door tends to be open and you yep. even let me walk in there. Of course. Uh, I've learned so much by going other places and that's one of the things I encourage everybody to do is just go somewhere and talk to people you don't naturally talk to because who knows what you're gonna learn. We've got time for one more question. I'm not sure I can segue this question from the interesting discussion that just occurred, but um, what I'd like to do is point out that a lot of the discussion has had to do with the um, operation of the physical plant, how to become more um, sustainable as in terms of our physical plant. And of course, Kathy and Mike have been referring to the importance of teaching and learning, and especially the learning part, which of course points us to the curriculum. Uh, as well as the teaching practices. And so what, what sorts of practices and policies or are, 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 are becoming visible in the curriculum that you would like to highlight that would suggest that this university is moving towards a, a greater awareness of global, global stewardship issues? And what sorts of structural and policy and practice changes might we take? I can try to take the lead on that. Um, good question. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, things are evolving here on campus. Actually, we have some really uh, neat new curriculum uh, curricular programs. One in the Energy Institute that uh, Mike is the leader of the Energy Sustainability Certificate, which has been around five, six years now. I think so. Yeah, it's, uh, it, which is a great example of a, a, where students have a collection of courses which provide them with um, uh, educational experiences to essentially to, to build that uh, commitment. And it has a capstone component which actually 
builds in a practicum where they actually take their what they've learned and put it into action. Uh, we also have a sustainability certificate that, cross my fingers, will be approved soon. Uh, we've gone through a long and arduous road with that. Pat, are you still around? Pat Egan? Yeah. <laughs> Pat's the one leading that initiative. Uh, we're very close to the end. And that's another campus level initiative that's got sustainability principles at, at the foundation level. Uh, a curriculum in your major, and then a capstone experience that brings students from different parts of campus together to have to solve campus and local community sustainability issues in a practical setting, but they have to, they really have to solve it from a diverse group's perspective. So you've got a business student, engineering student, and a geologist, for example, all having to work together and bring their diversity of views and build a, a common vision about how to create a solution. Um, those are pretty new and uh, I think uh, exciting types of certificates available on campus. And they do bring different groups of students together. That, and I understand the energy sustainability certificate is traditionally was for engineering students, but it's going right. to become broader as well, right? Well, I think, it, I think any student can take it. Uh, we've arranged it in such a manner you don't have to be an engineering major. Good. Yeah. So lots Great, of good an things. excellent job. There is. <laughs> and I, 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 from everybody I've talked to here, and I know I'm physical plant and not part of the, the, the uh, faculty or anything like that, so I'm kind of speaking from an outside standpoint, but I know there is a real eagerness to try to get it more integrated into the curriculum, and there's a real emphasis on wanting to try to do that. Now, it's obviously not going to happen overnight, but I think if we continue to keep the work up and to try to show that this isn't something that's going to be added to the curriculum, but will be something that will be part of the curriculum, so that it's just something that we do, and it isn't something that's going to be additional work for faculty to do, because they've got plenty to do already, and, and, and other campuses I've been at, they've always been reluctant to say, well, I don't need another thing to do, because I've got plenty to do the way it is. So I think if we can all just think more about how do we integrate the aspects of sustainability, because when you're thinking about it from the standpoint of social, economical, or environmental, there's lots of avenues that you can come at to integrate different pieces of it into it. And so everything from dance classes to art classes to history classes to English classes, science and engineering, all can benefit by looking into the different aspects of you know, what is called sustainability now. But it's, it's more, you know, almost we shouldn't be calling it responsibility as opposed to sustainability. Oh, it's been a little bit of additional work, Rob. <laughs> What's that? Just a little bit. Yeah. I've had three folks from the physical plan in my class. Right. And to all truth be told, your support has made it much easier, both on my being able to go to them and their being willing to come spend time with me. But the payback has been huge, having somebody who runs the... Uh, the heating and cooling plants in, somebody who did the lighting, having the director we can serve in, having these folks interacting with students, people who don't ordinarily get to talk to each other, has been superb. But oh yeah, it's been additional work. <laughs> Kathy, could you just talk a little bit about your 126 class? I think this is I a great example of a new about. type of curriculum, which is very practical, hands-on, and teaches students real connections with the environment around them. Ah, uh, yes. Real quick. Real quick. So thanks to the folks at the table, uh, they egged me on, bugged me to create a course which is place-based, and I narrowed the curriculum down to two things, energy on campus and food on campus, and they're really two sides of the same coin. Uh, the way I describe it to my colleagues is I used to look for the answers in the back of the book when I didn't know how to do something, because chemistry has millions of problems, and they all have answers, and they are in a book, and if they're not in your book, you can find them in another book. To teach this course, it wasn't that the answers were in the back of the book. There wasn't even a book. The stories, the uh, information was all in people on campus who I hadn't been talking to before. So I had to sort of go figure it out, what happened. And the one last piece of information I'll add is that there, it's hard to get a historical perspective on all the things the physical plant is doing, and the stories are getting lost. For example, they were the lighting folks were in the chancellor's office two weeks ago taking out the, was it fluorescence and putting in LEDs, or was yep. it incandescent? Yep, that's what it was. Yeah. They were changing the bulbs. Well, there's a whole story there. What bulbs went out? What went in? What happened with the chancellor? How does she like it? And can you give me the numbers and the bulbs, and I can do the math and actually point out what happened and what the payback period is? 
but nobody photographed. We have some photographs. You got some. <laughs> see, this is why we come together. I'll be in your office. Thank you, Rob. Yes, but I, I will say, Kathy has actually been a pioneer, and it's been people mm -hmm. like her who actually have gone out to make this happen that are going to show the way and to show that it isn't impossible to do. And fun. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all. This has been very great to hear your perspectives on lots of campus issues and how um, we're addressing those issues from research and education to campus operations. So thank you all very, very much. Let's give them a round of thanks.